Well, hello again. Welcome to Horror in Detail. Today we are going to share Wendigo and Cryptids encounter stories. First story. This story was shared by you slash Foxiana123 so credits to him. A Wendigo is watching me. Recently, a few months ago, I moved into a new house in the mountains. It's almost always cold and I'm surrounded by woods, but I like it as it's easier to do my job in isolation, with little distractions. I sell paintings and am paid a small monthly check to write poems for a magazine that is both online and physical. The new surroundings have given me all sorts of inspiration both for writing and painting. The strange occurrences started about a week into me living here. More and more frequently I'd find dead animals nearby. Not really gored or anything. Just dead. Rabbits, birds, and the occasional fox. It freaked me out, but I just assumed a predator of sorts was showing off because they felt threatened by me. I decided to always carry around a gun and a taser, just to be safe. I also decided to call an expert of the mountains and asked him to visit. When he came he seemed worried. Now this man was a fairly old Native American who had lived on these mountains for about his whole life, so this concerned me, knowing he knew just about everything on this mountain. He sat me down and told me a tale of a dark creature, born of hunger and cold, a wendigo. I was skeptical, this was a creature of fiction, at least, I thought it was. He left with a stern warning to never stray too far from home without good reason, and never follow the voices of the forest, as it may be a wendigo luring me to their feeding grounds. I spent the next few days watching the woods closely, maybe if I got a glimpse of whatever was in the woods my mind could be put at ease. At first I saw nothing, then I saw swift movement among the underbrush and trees. It wasn't until around the fifth day of watching, I saw something clearly, something standing upright, with deer-like legs, staring at me with pale eyes. I quickly went inside, suddenly feeling chilled to the bone. It took a bit and some self-pumping before I could go back outside to do my painting and wood-watching. I found myself putting what I could see of the creature in my paintings, but I could never catch the coldness of its eyes quite right. It fascinated and terrified me greatly, but I couldn't stop. The creature got braver, showing a bit more as time passed. I could now confirm it had a large set of antlers and its front limbs were not hooves like its back legs but claws. It watched me almost as curiously as I watched it. I knew then that it was likely a wendigo, one that decided to watch me, although I didn't dare attempt to approach it, knowing its curious nature might be as deceiving as a wolf's smile. Although I never verbally called it this name, I subconsciously named it Branch, it seemed suiting. He started, or I think it was him, pushing over items on my porch, like empty paint pots and small decorations, going back to the tree line by the time I come outside. It didn't really bother me as nothing got damaged, kind of reminded me of a cat actually. I began speaking to it, not expecting responses. While I painted I would just ramble out loud, knowing he was just at the trees. I don't know if he listened but I think he did, as his ears would face towards me the whole time, those long slightly disproportionate ears. One day he appeared with scars, a few still bleeding, this concerned me but I couldn't get close to him. He was an injured animal and would even more likely attack me if I got close. After a few days they healed to pale marks on his skin, this happened a few times but I learned to ignore it. This routine went on for a good while, I watched him, he watched me, but we kept our distance, but that changed yesterday. He approached me, and I didn't even notice till I saw his shadow. I looked up and saw shaggy black fur that smelled like rotting meat. I could see his cold empty eyes so clearly now, 
they were genuinely curious, but hungry. I didn't move, I froze up, I didn't even shiver. After what seemed like an eternity, he turned and headed towards the trees. I didn't dare move until he disappeared among the trees. I went inside and called the man that warned me of them. He agreed to come pick me up when we could. I'm waiting for the man to get here, Branch is staring at me through the window. A few hours after the man pulled in the front, which unlucky for me, was where Branch was. I got the meat chop I had pulled out earlier and stepped outside, Branch was staring through the window, when he turned to look at me I made sure to look at his chest fur rather than his eyes, soulless cold eyes. I threw the meat, he ignored it, didn't even twitch. I started to slowly move towards the man's truck, Branch's eyes tracking me. As I moved off the porch he started to follow me, his hooves making heavy footfall on the wood. His eyes never left me as I slowly made my way to the car, he slowly followed, staying three feet away, no more no less. When I finally made it in he was still staring, with those cold empty eyes. The man slowly pulled out and started down the long mountain trail. He started muttering about how I shouldn't have let it get this far as well as other. Colorful words and terms. Right now I'm at his cottage at the base of the mountain, I'm still shaken and I don't know if I want to risk going back. His wife is lovely and treats me well, as far as guests go, but I know I'll have to leave soon. The man explained that the Wendigo was one well known on the mountain, known for only attacking young females, always leaving the head intact. Now this is only semi-relevant, as, I am a man. But he can't explain why he's taken a sudden interest in me, maybe he's contemplating eating me. In a few hours he's taking me back, he's given me food, a gun, several rounds, and, a blowtorch. I got home an hour ago, Branch wasn't there, but my porch looked like a tornado passed, and I think there's shit by the doorstep. I quickly went inside and locked the doors the windows. I don't think he knows I'm back yet, and I frankly I don't want him to know. It's been a few hours and no sign of him, I don't want to go outside to tidy up my porch, I'm too scared to. It's hard to swallow the sandwich I made because of the tension I'm feeling, but I have to eat. I think I'm gonna take a nap after I finish it. He's here, he's staring into the windows and making distorted huffs and brays, occasionally stamping his hooves on the porch. He can't see me right now cause I'm behind the couch, he sounds angry. He started banging his antlers on the glass, he's trying to break it, it's starting to crack. The glass shattered, my heart is pounding, my ears are ringing, I can smell the rotten meat he reeks of. He crawled in through the window, I think he can smell me. He started knocking over random things but I'm frozen, I can't bring myself to peek, I might try to make a run for it, or I'll have to wait it out. He just went down the hall, I'm gonna go out the front and run. I don't know how far I ran. But the sun went down by the time I stopped and the temp is definitely below freezing. Luckily I was already wearing a heavy coat, and I found a small overhang, will rest, hopefully he doesn't find me. I woke up, but it's still dark out, it's only 12, I slept 3 hours. I'm shivering like crazy but the overhang helps a little, blocking the wind. The forest seems still, Nothing is stirring, not even the owls are hooting. I'm gonna go back to sleep, hopefully it's light out when I wake up this time. I woke up an hour or so ago and started walking towards the base of the mountain, my limbs feel numb but the movement has helped. The forest is still eerily quiet, and I keep finding blood puddles and tufts of fur. I think Branch threw a massive tantrum. I need to find a house with people in it, safety in numbers. I didn't bring the gun, I know, I'm stupid, but I just wanted away from him. I started running again, 
I heard what sounded like hooves and I swear I smelled rotting flesh again, if he catches me on his turf, I'm honestly fair game to kill, even if I'm not his preferred food. I found a field of corpses, deer, bears, rabbits, wolves, birds. Dead animals everywhere. I quickly went around it, holding my breath, trying not to puke. I guess that's why the forest was so quiet. He killed all the animals in a fit, like a violent child throwing a tantrum, a child that could easily rip out my throat and cave in my ribcage and skull. I'm seriously hoping he isn't following me. I can see houses, I think I found one of those retreats for monks or whatever who take vows of silence. I'm gonna see if they can help me. So, good news, they happily let me into a living area where I could warm up and provided food and a warm drink, I think it's just milk. They contacted someone and wrote me a note saying that someone would be coming for me to take me off the mountain. A few decided to be curious so I explained what happened, a few wrote me off but others gave me scared shocked looks. They've taken me to bedroom and communicated that I can sleep until the person coming to get me actually gets here. When he does, I'm not going back, my things can stay there, as can Branch. I'll find somewhere else to live, like an apartment, in a city, with people. I was able to sleep a few hours before the guy came, I told him to just take me to the nearest town. I'm outside a motel right now slowly making calls and arrangements. I'm never going back to that place, with that thing. Ever. Second story. This story was shared by you slash embarrassed underscore yam underscore 3534 so credits to him. Wendigos are coming back now we can't escape. I'm from a small town so you might not know about this. I'm living with my parents. Was living with my parents anyway so I am interested in cryptozoology. Wendigos, skinwalkers, all that. My friend came to me the other day and told me about this creature he saw with a deer skull outside of his house. His house is two houses down it was a wendigo I told him what it was and what it does. He wanted to vomit, I wanted to vomit. We waited for a couple more days we waited and waited until something happened. A park was near us a couple of miles from us a couple was killed there and only their child emerged. It was a child no more than seven or eight years old blonde, you get the picture. We pulled her aside and asked her what happened she said something that will haunt me to my grave. She said that a deer skull creature had come to the park and told her to play with it the parents played to the girl said that they played hide and seek she hid in a broken tree I asked her what did she do after that and she said she was never found and then she came from the park. She said something horrifying she said she heard her parents scream and then she heard tearing splattering and screams of agony, then some staff came over and pulled her aside. Before she could go I asked her I said, how did it not kill you she said because it wasn't there. A couple more days and about 34 children and 26 adults have been murdered and there have been sightings of over 40 wendigos eating chatting. Me and my friends have decided enough is enough we brought guns, flamethrowers, explosives my friend let's name him Ryan he stockpiled on hundreds of shotgun shells a Saga 12, AK-47, Glocks and a homemade bomb. I got another friend he took a lot of begging but he agreed. We went to a park that was a hotspot for Wendigos, we found four bodies unknown, we went on and found a forest and we said okay this is probably it we went into the forest we brought a dodge hellcat if we needed to escape. We ran for over a mile and slowed down and set camp. Ryan told me about eyes in the forest following us, my other friend let's call him Scott he was seeing dead mangled animals on the ground. We found our first wendigo. We went into the forest and found the wendigo. It moved at unbelievable speeds at well over 100 miles per hour, we let Ryan unleash his Saga 12, 
the Wendigo let out horrid screams, I quickly pulled out a flamethrower and burned it alive we sat there for fifteen minutes as the Wendigo was cooking and screaming. We picked the body up and took out its heart we heard more creatures we knew it was more Wendigos, before we could look to see what happened Scott was gone. We found a trail of blood going deep into the woods we couldn't go after him because there were two more of these damn things on us. I shot one over fourteen time it ran back into the forest. I went after the other wendigo and cut its heart out with the sharpest stick I could find. Me and Ryan waited for over an hour just sitting praying Scott would come back me and Scott went deeper only to find Scott's body, mangled he had no eyes his ribs and insides were showing we found a walkie talkie next to his body we turned it on and something spoke it at Scott's voice. It said in his voice help guys it's eating my stomach it said. We ignored it we looked over and saw one of those little craps about 300 feet away from us, it was the one I shot god knows how many times. I ran towards it with flame thrower I lit it up and it was screaming in agony as I was burning it alive for over 20 minutes I sat down next to Ryan we both said we need to get Scott's body, then Scott sat down next to us and said hey guys I'm back. We aimed our weapons at his chest and we asked him a series of questions he got all correct. We went home we had slaughtered three wendigos. We came back three days later we brought our homemade bomb we went into the forest for over 26 miles we found two wendigos one of them killed Ryan stole him and nearly slaughtered him in the forest, we then blew up the wendigo. The three of us went and shot the other Wendigo with a Saga 12 in the chest hitting its heart killing it. The Wendigos got retaliation and killed two people only a fraction of their losses. Last week it was outside my window it had the walkie talkie we both talked at first said want to come out to play it looks nice out today. I snapped back no you just want to kill me. You are right I will kill you you look very appetizing up there. I got my AR-15 and shot it god knows how many time. It ran into the forest and it said through the walkie-talkie with Sabrina's voice she was my sister but she had been dead for over three years. It said alright, I will give you a choice in one hour I will kill someone you love or I can have your hand. Neither I snarled back it then said in Scott's voice alright, I will do both then I locked my door and slept praying that I won't die tonight. I heard scratching in my door for over four hours I screamed at my door, the wendigo then said. If you can eat why can't I eat also? We need so much food and right now we need food and you are my food at the moment. I waited and waited and waited, wanting this thing to get out of my house, then it ran out of my house, it ran with incredible speed out of my house, it ran so fast that I thought that the house was going to collapse any second. Scott and Ryan went out of state to Ohio we found more Wendigos, they had followed us to Ohio. They rammed our vehicle with such force it went flying over 600 yards away. We unloaded shots straight onto them and did some numbers taking out six of them. We had to retreat back to our town over 80 miles away, we almost died several times along the way, more killings have been inflicted, two couples four children and sixteen adults. Three days ago my friend Ryan was found dead. Me and Scott stayed up for several hours discussing this. I was suspicious of Scott because I felt he had this dark force around him I asked him well over thirty questions. I didn't care I was going to spot an error. After three hours he got no incorrect. Over fourteen hours later Scott then looked at me, he smiled and he had jagged teeth, he then said, he tasted like cherries and one day I'll taste you too. Third story. This story was shared by you slash Lucy Boo underscore twenty two, so credits to him. The Wendigo that didn't leave me alone. I honestly don't know where to start or if I'm ready to be posting this story of mine. But hopefully it'll help. I know you won't believe me, and honestly I won't even blame you guys. 
It still doesn't make sense in my own head. I've heard stories about unknown creatures in woods but never thought I'd encounter one myself you know. I posted another story about some creepy old people that I had encountered in the woods but that's nothing. This makes a good horror story for people but it eats me every day. But here we go. I love to go hiking. I go with my three-year-old German Shepherd, and let her go unleashed since we like to go to secluded places. Now I have been hiking all over Utah mountains, and wanted a new hike that wasn't too far from me. I have an app that tells me about hikes near me, if it is a hard hike, reviews and if it's dog friendly. Now I was scrolling through all trail looking for possibly something new but I wasn't too hopeful. But to my delight, there was something new. I don't know why I don't remember the name of it, but I do remember it was at the bottom of the list and it had one review saying, good, I thought that was kind of strange, mostly because people love to review hikes and try to tell the city what they can do to improve the hike and make it more safe, but I figured it wasn't a popular hike. So the next day Kyrie and I packed up our stuff and went up towards the hike. I always carry first aid kit, extra food, a knife and just emergency stuff in case I get lost. It's important to mention now that Kyrie eats a raw diet. Meaning she eats raw meat not cooked, and since we were going so early in the morning I thought I could bring some with us. I put it in her blue backpack I make her wear and decided when it was getting warmer we would stop to eat. Where I live, there's a long drive through the canyon and many roads going towards the hike you'd like to go on. This one was a little further than I'm used to but I didn't care it was new and I was excited so was Kyrie. She cries in the car until we get there. Now I was following the directions on my phone and saw that it had lead me towards a thin road that was hidden. No wonder I haven't heard of this place, it was hidden and far up the mountain. The road only fit one car so the whole time I was so anxious that another car would come down, and how I would handle that but there never was. I never saw another car. When I got to the parking lot, if I could call it that, I noticed there was only space for like three cars. All in a tight space. It was small, so I decided to park my car with the front facing towards the road. I thought maybe it was private property, checked the app but it didn't say anything about private property. I shrugged it off, got Kyrie out, prepared us and saw the trail. Now even though I knew there wasn't anyone parked there, I kept Kyrie on a leash. I didn't know if there were bikers along the trail, but after 30 minutes or so I didn't see anyone I decided to let her off leash. It was a steep hike for the first half, but it was beautiful. We were deep in the woods, and I felt at peace. I used to wear headphones when I hiked but didn't anymore so I was enjoying the natural sounds of the forest. It was still early in the morning so I wore a light jacket and decided when it got warmer I'd give Kyrie her breakfast. Now before you start to hate, I know. I know bringing Kyrie's raw meat was absolutely stupid and ignorant of me. I had never seen a bear or wolf or anything so I got cocky and just thought it was okay. I learned my lesson the bad day, so no need to tell me I was dumb. But honestly I wouldn't blame you if you commented that. Now here is where we begin the bad part of this story. The trail finally stopped being steep and sort of an easy hike from here. When you got to the top, you could see through the trees a beautiful open meadow. On the other side of it, you can hear a river and a waterfall. The trail went around the meadow. The meadow was absolutely beautiful with the mountains in the background, the sound of the water. This hike was almost the most beautiful one I had ever been to. When Kyrie and I were sort of in the center of the meadow, she stopped right in front of me and looked towards the meadow. Kyrie always walked ahead of me and when she stopped I stopped since I trusted her judgment. Before I could look, the smell hit me first. 
You know the typical rotting smell but oh my god. Words cannot explain how bad it stank. It burned my nose, and started to make me tear up. I put my shirt over my nose, feeling nauseous and looked over to where Kyrie was looking. In the middle of the meadow was a deer. Now I've only seen does but never a male deer in person. But his antlers were huge. Have you ever seen Princess Minok? When he sees the deer spirit walking across the water, and how big his antlers were. Almost like that. The beauty of the deer was amazing but not enough to take away the disgusting smell that was making me sick. The deer was looking towards the mountains and away from me. I thought maybe Kyra's food was going bad, I checked that and it seemed fine. When I looked up again, the deer was looking towards our direction. I noticed that Kyra's hackles went up at that, she started to cry nervously. Now I've heard of Wendigos and Skinwalkers, I am Native American it is common for these creatures to be in our childhood stories. That and also listening to scary stories on YouTube. Now when Kyrie did that, I got a bad feeling in my stomach despite the sickness. It was a Wendigo and I knew that, now I didn't know what to do. These creatures were only a part of my stories to make me go to bed, not to instructions of what to do. Plus my grandmother was the one with the stories and passed away. She was the one with the experience not my mom or anyone else. I glanced at Kyrie again when she cried, and looked back towards the creature. It started to stand on its hind legs. Holy hell it was fucking tall, and it faced my direction. It started to walk towards me, I was going to run until I heard in my head. I am the one of this land. Suddenly it started to run towards me, full speed. I screamed, called Kyrie and started to run. Kyrie was following behind me. I started to cry as I was running since I could hear it catch up to me. It was loud. It was destroying everything it came in contact with to get to me. The adrenaline running through me was making me just focus on running. I didn't know where to go I just ran. The trail suddenly got smaller and bushes with thorns started to appear but I didn't feel them as they cut my arms. As I heard it got closer, it suddenly went to the left as I ran straight. I somehow had the balls to look back to see it was gone, but also Kyrie. Kyrie. I said but right as I called out for her, the trail ended with a foot drop onto a patch of rocks. I hit my head, bleeding a bit. But again I couldn't feel it that much and just got up. I looked towards the forest when I suddenly heard a loud cry from my right. It was Kyrie. Kyrie. I cried out. I stood up, crying and lost at what to do. I looked back to see a river leading up to the waterfall I heard. Suddenly a heavy weight ran into me and we both fell back. I hit my head again on the back and looked up to see Kyrie. Kyrie had blood all over her. It was pouring from her neck. Kyrie. I cried out. She was whimpering, and breathing heavy. She still had her backpack on with some cuts in it. Before I had a chance to help her, a scream came from the forest. I looked back at the waterfall, and somehow had the strength to pick up my 85-pound dog and carry her. I don't know where I was planning to go I was just running to the waterfall as if it was a safe place. I was almost there when I heard the creature land on the rocks that I did early. I tripped at that and looked back to see it looking at me. Its eyes were black or I think so, it could also be that there wasn't anything in there. I don't know. I took off Kyra's backpack and throw it towards the monster hoping it would take the meat and just leave us alone. I was scooting back towards the waterfall, crying as I did so. Holding and dragging Kyrie with my left arm. 
I found that being so close to the creature made me literally weak to my knees. It walked over to me, taking huge steps. It looked so different than before, before it looked like a deer and now as it crawled over to me it looked like, a monster. I don't know how else to describe this awful demon, I don't. I'm sorry. But I felt water hit my head hard as I had reached the waterfall. I kept going until I was up against the wall. There barely enough space where water wasn't hitting Kyrie and his faces. Kyrie felt limp at this point. I could somewhat see the creature through the water, but still saw it coming towards me. It stood on its hind legs when it was close enough to me, watching me. The smell was so disgusting, I couldn't help but throw up in my mouth. It reached his arms out to grab me, I screamed so loud. I actually lost my voice. After I let out that scream, another scream came from the deep forest. The creature snapped its head almost completely backward, looking towards the scream. The scream sounded like the one this one had let out earlier. I was still holding on to Kairi, crying and screaming since its arm was close. It looked back to me, pulling its arm away and again said in my mind, I am the one of this land. With that, it took steps back watching me and went down the river bank. It crawled on all fours, stopping next to Kairi's backpack. It ripped it apart and pulled out the meat eating it with the plastic bag that it was in. It suddenly screamed and ran towards that direction of the scream from earlier. When I thought it was gone, I stood up shakily and carried Kyrie towards the trail again. When I was running, I came across my backpack that I had left earlier and stopped. It was ripped apart so I took off my jacket and wrapped it around Kyrie's neck where she was bleeding a lot. After that, I barely remember. All I remember is carrying Kyrie and driving down, screaming the whole way towards the emergency vet. They asked us what happened and I told them it was a bear. They called the ambulance since I had blood all over me and they couldn't tell if it was mine or Kyrie's. Kyrie made it through surgery and had to have some stitches on her, along with a pad. It didn't really heal and a huge bump grew on there. It had been infected but eventually got better. She also had a bite mark on the top of her left eye, but that healed much better. They pulled out a 4-inch tooth, I don't have it because I couldn't even look at it but they declared it from a bear. Even though they said it looked weird. While I was waiting for Kyrie, I went to look up the trail on the app, and it was gone. It why or how but it is. I don't remember where it is either. That's all a blur. I have some pictures up of Kyrie. The one with my niece is a hike my mom took her on with my niece. It had been weeks after and my mom thought to try and help her through it. Kyrie looks nervous in the picture but you can see the huge bump on the left side of her neck. There's also a picture with Kyrie and her bandages around her neck. And the one that is the most recent of her neck, it's black. The stitches came out. The last picture is of the top of her head, also black but it's healed now. I'll have pictures of these but don't know where or how to post these. I haven't been hiking since, and I refuse to let Kyrie go. That time my mom took her she did it while I was at work but regretted it because she said Kyrie was crying and was so scared they had to just go home. My mom knows, I screamed at night from nightmares for a week or two. My mom put white candles in my room to get rid of the bad spirits attracted to my negativity. So yeah here's my story. I've heard stories where people saw a wendigo and they didn't get harmed and God I wish I went through that. I hate hiking. My therapist thinks I may have some PTSD but only knows of it as a bear. I'm getting through it, Kyrie is too. Hopefully one day I can go back but I don't see that being for a while.
Please if you're going to go up to the mountains, please please prepare. Mother Nature is not only unpredictable but has things in there that just don't make sense in our heads. So please be safe. I say that with serious sincerity. If there's any other subreddits I can post this to I would love to know, so I can share my story and maybe help others out there. Fourth story. This story was shared by you slash real ghosts 25, so credits to him. The Wendigo learned to tell time on Thanksgiving. I know what you're thinking. A mythical spirit being able to tell time isn't necessarily a bad thing. I'm here to tell you it's necessarily a bad thing. A horrible thing, in fact. Without the ability to tell time, the Wendigo would strike randomly, out of nowhere, maybe going decades or centuries without attacking. But maybe I'm being too naive. Maybe the Wendigo has made me naive, cloaking its murders in various, everyday seeming tragedies. I live out in the country, miles away from the excitement of city life, of neon sin shrouded in innocent novelty. Somehow, though, the chaos of city life found me. My father told me as long as you stay in the house you've lived in all your life, nothing could harm you. Like a fool, I believed him. I followed in my father's footsteps, and it led to my ruin. A kindly neighbor, Joe, moved in next door, although, next door, is a bit misleading since acres separate humans from each other out here. He was younger, spry, and full of beans. He had a wife, a quiet woman named Jennifer, and one child, barely five months old. Despite being at heart a good-natured fellow, he seemed stressed out because the child, Desmond, kept slipping from one illness to the next. One day things seemed especially bad, around Thanksgiving time if I recall. The leaves had all but been sucked off the trees, and it had been raining all day. I didn't have a good feeling about that day, something seemed off, a little too dismal. I had been thinking bad thoughts ever since the sun woke me up. The objective observer would tell you that this was because my wife expired a few months before, and that I still hadn't come out the other side yet, you know? But I know, the Wendigo, well, let's put it this way, when the Wendigo wants you to know he's coming, he'll give you clues the day before, sometimes the week before. Anyway, I told Joe about the Wendigo, about how if you knew what you were doing, you could make the spirit give your child, or anyone, a more stable flame of life if it was sputtering for some reason. He looked at me like I was crazy or something. I knew I wasn't. Eventually, he caught on, realizing a man with such sure convictions couldn't be wrong. I gave Joe the scroll I used to save my wife from the brink so many years ago. I told him the fine print was something worth reading. That if you performed the ritual in a wrong way, the Wendigo would be as clear-minded about mortal affair as you or me, be able to tell time, insert himself into the flow of our reality without missing a beat. Well, I won't go into too much detail about what happened, or how it happened. Joe performed the ritual wrong, as I knew he most likely would. But I just couldn't let a kid die, you know. I went to Joe's house for Thanksgiving. He knew I was a lonely old man who had just lost his wife. Usually, I wasn't one for a pity invite, but I figured I didn't want to spend the hours ticking off the seconds in my head and waiting for the axe to fall. Better to keep yourself busy. I'll never be able to get that grisly scene out of my head as long as I live. Joe's body was spread out on the coffee table his face looking miserable and defeated. Jennifer's corpse rested in the fireplace. The lights had been turned off except for a single dim bulb hanging from the kitchen ceiling. Desmond sat at the kitchen table, gnawing on his dad's fingers. He stared at me curiously, like a cat often stares at its master when eating its meal. Oh, why did you do it, Joe? 
You gave the scroll to an idiot. A man so addled at the prospect of losing his son, of being outside the pleasant rhythm of society, that he'd do just about anything in order to make sure his son stayed alive, Desmond said. His eyes were bleeding sockets, and it occurred to me that was how my dad said the Wendigo entered a human body, through the eyes, making them explode. Would you like a finger, maybe a thigh? It is Thanksgiving after all, Desmond gave me a wicked smile, a smile no child of five months should be capable of. Now you just stay right there, don't come any closer. I said in a firm voice. Joe just had to read the scroll in front of his wall clock, so desperate to save his son he couldn't read the fine print, Desmond went on. Surprisingly, Desmond didn't try to kill me that day. He told me my time was coming, and that I'd know when my curtain would flow across the dusty stage of my life when he wanted me to know. Then he got up, told me not to disturb his great feast because he would be back to devour them in their entirety. So many months have passed since then. The Wendigo devoured his victims, and it was like they never existed at all. Now I'm staring at my own wall clock, thinking every day the axe might fall. The Wendigo can tell time now, and he can confer with the Reaper, know the date and time of my death, and say, I know this old man should die via electrocution, but let me lend a helping hand. Fifth Story This story was shared by you slash Cashdoge so credits to him. I think an abandoned school is a Wendigo nest. Soon I will fall asleep and I will wake from this terrible dream. The endless night will fall, and I will rise. In my mind, I was wishing that exact thing to happen, after all of these horrific events. I was always that one guy in the group that believed in cryptids and such things. I always looked for the answer in the paranormal first, if that makes any sense. This was partially influenced by the fact that my uncle is also very interested in all things dark, creepy and mysterious. Aliens, spirits, monsters, theories and such things were always his thing. I knew he was the right guy to talk to whenever something weird happened to me, as no one else would believe me. Because of my uncle's influence of me, I've kind of learned not to fuck with anything that may kill me, ghosts, monsters, demons and such things. This skill has come in handy during my life. All up to this one series of events. Late December, 2015. Me and a few friends have decided to check out our old school, which is now abandoned. Yeah, what a horrible setting. Abandoned school, a few friends, night, winter. Classic horror movie scenario. Not something any normal person would enjoy doing, right? Well, I certainly wouldn't call us normal. We're a few weirdos, I guess you could say. Now, this was our middle school and it was quite a ride from my home. Around 20 to 30 minutes with the car. The terrain was horrible. It was in a forest and the snow was making it even harder to drive. The whole drive took us around 40 minutes in the end. Once we arrived there, the gate was obviously closed. No one had been in this place for years. Heck, I don't even know why they ever closed down. It was a private school too and it seemed to do fairly well. Before hopping over the gate, we looked around us only to see no cars, no houses and no people around us in a five to six mile radius. Chris facebombed and said that we should have brought a flashlight. I comforted him and pulled out four flashlights out of my backpack. I came prepared. I handed one to Chris and the rest of the crew, keeping one to myself, of course. Now that everyone was fully prepared, we jumped over the fence and got into the parking lot. It was huge. We walked towards the school entrance for around one minute. That just goes to show how large the parking lot was. 
The school is even larger. We got to the entrance and will try pushing the door. Of course, it was locked. Chained, to be exact. We didn't notice it was chained at first. There was really no choice but to break the glass on the door. I told Will and Andrew to go find a large rock to break the glass with while Chris and I go search around the main entrance for other doors. We nodded our heads and split up agreeing to meet at the main entrance whenever we're finished with our duties. As Chris and I were walking around the school, we got to the window area, which was close to the back entrance. The window area is basically a huge wall of all the classroom windows. Four floors of classrooms. Chris tapped me on the shoulder and told me to take a look at the furthest window to the left. Second floor. See that? He said. What? Looks like a pair of eyes to me, he whispered. Holy sh, I quietly screamed. Chris put his and on my mouth as we were both staring at whatever was in that creepy broken old window. We slowly moved away from it while still going to our destination, which just so happened to be right next to the window. The snow made our footsteps louder and, as we came closer to the window, the eyes turned towards us. Chris and I jumped down on the ground. As the snow was slowly covering our white jackets, we were seemingly invisible. The creature must have overlooked us because it looked back at the large soccer field and then disappeared. We got up and continued towards the back entrance while discussing what just happened. What was that? Chris loudly asked as if he was quizzing me. I don't know. I've heard too many stories about different beings and, from what we saw, I can't really make anything out. Could have been literally anything. I tried explaining to him. Jesus Christ man, this shit is making me even more tense and anxious than before. Abandoned school, Chris said with fear in his voice. As we were getting closer to the back entrance, which was the coffee shop built into the school, we heard a loud sound which sounded like glass breaking. We were scared shitless. I looked at Chris and he looked at me. We understood each other perfectly without any words being said. We instantly ran back to the front entrance to see what the that sound was. As we were getting closer my phone rang. I looked at the number and it was Will. Hey man, we managed to find a large rock and we broke the glass door. Oh, thank God. We got scared when we heard that noise coming from the front door. We're on our way. Yeah, one more thing. There's another door behind the first one so. Yeah, I know. You can just break it with the same rock. Right, see you here then. Phew. I was relieved. I explained everything to Chris and he was delighted. Almost got a heart attack. As we got to the front entrance, we heard another loud noise of glass breaking. It was Will and Andrew breaking the other glass door. We met up and entered through the front entrance. We decided to split up as we previously did. However, this time, since we didn't bring walkie-talkies, we would stay on the phone for the entire time. We all agreed and me and Chris went to the cafeteria and coffee shop area, while Will and Andrew went towards the classrooms. Specifically the 7th and 8th grade classrooms. Alright, time to explain the school's layout a bit so you can better understand the whole story. The school has four floors, as previously mentioned. Grades 1 to 3 and the kindergarten children are on floor 1. Grades 4, 5 and 6 are on the second floor. Grades 7 and 8 are on the third floor along with the coffee shop and the cafeteria. And lastly, high school students from grades 1 to 4 are on the fourth floor, where the IT room is. 
Now, there's also a basement where the swimming pool is as well as the smallest kindergartners that could get into the school. Yeah, it's very diverse and large. Now, as previously said, Chris and I went to explore the coffee shop and the cafeteria slash kitchen. Grades 7 and 8 are on the opposite side of the huge hallway. The walk towards the third floor was just horrific. While we were climbing the first set of stairs towards the third floor, we were petrified by a loud noise of something dropping down in the kindergarten area. The one on the first floor. And god fucking damn it were we terrified. What was that? Chris exclaimed with a surprising amount of cursing. I don't know man. I yelled in a medium tone with a shaky voice, how I usually am when I'm scared. Oh, God, this was such a horrible idea, there's something down there. I guarantee it. Listen, don't worry. Let's just get done with this search or whatever the fuck it is that we're doing here. Wait. What are we doing here? Chris asked. This shook me for some reason. What are we doing here? I genuinely could not remember. Yeah. I really don't know. I know this sounds stupid, but when Andrew suggested we go here, I just listened and didn't ask why. I was just so pumped by the sole idea of doing something like this. I've always wanted to explore a huge abandoned building like this one. I explained while asking myself the same question, why are we here? This time, we didn't just let go this whole thing. It was really creepy. Especially since Andrew didn't even go here. Why would he decide for this very place to be our abandoned adventure? There are a lot more different locations we could have explored which he knows much better. Chris and I were just stunned. We've already walked up to the third floor while discussing this and decided to head for the cafeteria. Chris pulled his flashlight out and tried turning it on. It didn't work. Oh, fuck. I thought to myself, I forgot to put in batteries in a few of my flashlights. God damn it. Let's just hope mine is fully or at least somewhat charged. Luckily, it was. After turning my flashlight on, I realized that we haven't heard from Andrew or Will in a long time, considering we're on the phone the entire time. I looked at my phone and, it was off. What the fuck? I specifically remember telling everyone to charge their phones. I charged mine to 100% too. Heck, I even remember seeing the percentage being around 95% when the first call took place. This is extremely weird. Once Chris realized that my phone is out, he started throwing up random theories about ghosts turning off our technology and stuff like that. I simply told him it could be some sort of battery or software issue and tried turning the phone on again. It turned on and the Apple logo appeared on the screen. Finally, we got to the cafeteria. Now, this place is huge and I mean huge. It has around 100 chairs for sure. I didn't count the tables, but I remember being able to eat with a huge amount of people at the same time. We looked over some of the tables to see if anything interesting could be found. Nothing. We decided to head for the kitchen, which was in the cafeteria itself, in the back. We were just about to turn towards the kitchen door when we heard a loud bang coming from inside the kitchen. Chris screamed and ran out the cafeteria door. I myself was petrified. I couldn't move my legs or my arms. I was so scared by this sudden noise. Like a jump scare, but 200 times worse. When I finally managed to gather the strength to move my legs I instantly ran towards the exit. I managed to catch a glimpse of something looking out of the kitchen behind the counter. Something human, but not human. 
hard to explain. Weird dark but at the same time light skin. That's all I could really get out of that short look. As I ran out of the cafeteria door, I saw Chris running towards the 7th and 8th grade classrooms, where Will and Andrew were. He was screaming their names and telling them we have to get out of this place. I ran towards him and, while I was turning the corner to get to the 7th grade classroom, I managed to see something horrific. Something very similar to whatever I saw in the cafeteria was peeking out the cafeteria door. Not alone this time. With two friends, of the same kind. Holy sure. I thought to myself. I finally got to the seventh grade classroom to find it trashed and empty. I got out of it and saw Will and Chris in the bathroom with scared looks on their faces waving for me to come into the bathroom. You guys won't believe Dash, I tried saying. Yeah, we saw it too. Some sort of weird creature, Will whispered. Yo, there's three more down by the cafeteria. I screamed while whispering. Wait, where's Andrew, the realization hit me. He just, he just disappeared, Will stuttered to say. I attempted to reply but was instead silenced by Will's right hand on my mouth. As we saw two of those, creatures walking out of the seventh grade classroom looking around, for US. I assumed. Chris was, in the meantime, crying silently in one of the bathroom stalls. You could barely hear him until he did something that I instantly wanted to kill him for doing. A short loudish sniff was heard from the stall Chris was in. I saw one of them turn towards us in the reflection and start walking. As the creature was walking towards us I got a better look at it. Sharp teeth, pale inhuman skin, head shape of a dog, or moose. Moose is more like it, but this creature had a smaller head. It really resembled a wendigo. To me at least. It was walking slowly towards us. Then, a loud bang was heard, it startled us. We were quietly panicking while this creature was still walking towards us. Will was still holding his hand on my mouth and I'm glad he was. Otherwise, I would have let out an extremely loud scream because of all the terror experienced that night. The creature, however, didn't even budge. It was still looking right at the bathroom and walking slowly towards it. Then, it turned its head towards the sound, got on all fours and started running. I could hear it distancing from us. I then pushed Will's hand off my mouth to ask him a few questions. I was panicking. Jesus Christ did you see that thing? Man. Chris you diet. We could have been killed here. Oh my god, we have to get out of here. I ordered. Yeah we do, and never return here. Yeah, it was a stupid idea even coming here. We should call the police or someone that's capable of dealing with shit like this right now. No, calm down. Let's first focus on finding Andrew and getting out of here. Right. Okay. I agreed. I slowly peeked out of the bathroom door while Will was getting Chris. None of those creatures were visible, but neither was Andrew. I signaled both of them to follow me as we exited the bathroom. We found ourselves in a dark hallway and turned on our flashlights. Will guided us towards where he last saw Andrew. Middle of the hallway, girl's bathroom. I was not about to get trapped in another bathroom. Plus, there were like four of those creatures right down the hall in the cafeteria and coffee shop. Chris said that we should check out if Andrew was in the girl's bathroom and then get out of here. We all liked the sound of that. As we slowly approached the girl's bathroom, we were noticed by one of the smaller sized creatures. He instantly started running towards us and we ran into the girl's bathroom. 
Everybody hid in one of the stalls, except for Chris. I guess he didn't make it in time or the creature saw him. I don't know. I was too scared to even check out what the fuck happened. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. Is Chris dead? I whispered to Will in the other stall. No, don't say that. We don't have any proof right now. He violently replied. Proof. What proof do you need other than his silent screams and the sound of that creature eating whatever is left of him? I guess I was a bit too loud with that last sentence because I could hear the creature stop eating Chris. I assumed it heard me and I banged the stall door hitting the creature in the head. I started beating it as hard as I could. And when I thought it was down I looked over to Chris. He was dead. Obviously half eaten by whatever I just beat up. I banged on Will's stall door and told him to get out. We're getting out of here. Now. I ordered. But we have to find Andrew. Andrew man. He's probably dead too. Just like Chris. We're getting out of here now. Let's make a run for it. We made a run for it. I could hear and see around 10 plus of those creatures coming down from the fourth floor and around four of them coming out of the cafeteria to chase us down. Some came out of the kindergarten as well. However, we made it. We were out of the school, but still not out of the entire property. Not out of the large gate separating freedom from guaranteed death. We ran faster than we have ever ran before. We jumped the fence and saw the car. Completely trashed. Someone, or something, broke in and trashed the fuck out of the car. It couldn't drive like this. We had no choice but to run wherever we could. This time, we insisted on not splitting up and both ran towards the small town around 1.5 miles away. We followed the road and managed to get away from them. However, I managed to get one last look at the moose-headed one. The one that spared us on the bathroom. It had glowing human-like red eyes and no tail. Skinny body with parts of its skin torn out. Horrible. When we arrived at the village everyone was looking at us as if we were crazy. It was likely because of how scared and worn out we looked. I called up my uncle and shortly explained what happened. He told us that the best thing to do would be to go to someone with experience with these creatures. Someone who is Indian. The old American type. Simply because there's apparently some ritual to get rid of the curse these creatures might have put on us. We asked around for anyone that might be of that heritage or knows something about what just happened to us. Finally, we managed to find one old man who lived with his wife and one teenage son. We entered his house and told him the story. He said something about us being their target now. He also told us he suspects these might be wendigos or skinwalkers. He preformed the ritual on us and blessed us. I guess he removed the curse since we never saw another one of them again. We never found Andrew, but we do think he was somehow tied into this entire incident. I just don't know how. I will find out for sure though. Sixth story. This story was shared by you slash throw away 451, so credits to him. I'm a skeptic, but I've seen the Wendigo. Sorry in advance for the long post. I'm the sort of person who is skeptical of any claims regarding the existence of the supernatural. My wife claims to see ghosts slash dead people and that she's an empath, and I'll concede that she's a very good guesser regarding other people's emotions and the history of places and families. But I can't accept her statements as fact because they're not empirically provable. With that said, you can believe me or not 
but what I'm about to say is something that even I have a lot of trouble disbelieving. I can't say I've had any paranormal experiences in my life, but there are several things that happened when I was quite young that I simply can't explain. By the time I was about 12 to 18 months old, I had either a memory or a very vivid imagination of my life before birth. I was floating up in the sky, standing on thin air, with no land in any direction. In front of me was a kindly middle-aged Native American man wearing a plain white robe. He asked me if I was ready, some kind of vision flashed before my eyes, and when I said, yes, I somehow descended and experienced my own birth. Keep in mind that this is before I was able to comprehend what birth was. I also didn't know about Native Americans yet. When I was about six or seven, I started getting very distinct mental images of something extremely disturbing. What I saw was a tanned, mummified-looking, emaciated dead face. The eyes were glassy but somehow horribly alive, and the lips and nose were shrunken. The creepiest thing about the face was the two-wide smile and a full set of very white teeth. When I was nine or ten, I read for the first time about some expedition or other in the Antarctic where several ill-fated members of an expeditionary group died and were left behind. Their bodies were recovered in the 20th century, and the article I was reading had images of them. I had never seen a frozen body before, but as soon as I saw those pictures, I immediately correlated what I was reading with the thing I'd seen earlier in life. From that point onward, I started having almost real waking visions, in a way that's hard to explain more than just in my mind's eye, and yet not exactly as if it were actually in front of me, of something that is basically my worst nightmare. It was an eight or nine foot tall, I know this because its head almost touched the ceiling, frozen corpse, completely naked, with long arms and legs. It was the same face I'd seen before in my mind, with shrunken features, etc., only now it had a full body that was just as emaciated and mummified as the head and neck were. I only saw it on cloudy days in the late fall or winter, and always when it was between me and a window so it was sort of backlit. It never made any motion to do anything, just stared down at me with that horrible grin. In high school, I got onto Wikipedia at some point and finally learned what the thing was the Wendigo. For those who don't know, it's a mythical spirit creature in Algonquian legend. I was born in Connecticut and have about 1% Native American blood in me from about 400 years ago my first traceable ancestors in America came over shortly after the Mayflower and one of them married a Native American woman. Now do you see part of why I'm so creeped out? According to legend, the Wendigo was an evil spirit associated with starvation, the winter, and cannibalism. It either lured desperate people into eating their fellow humans during the winter, or possessed those who did resort to cannibalism. There are various stories about how it looked, but most of them agree that it looks like a frozen corpse, generally taller than a human, and no, it doesn't have antlers like in all the modern depictions you'll find via Google search. It reportedly can ride on the winter wind, mimic human voices to lure the unwary into ambushes, and has a heart made of ice. Here's the thing, I experienced this before I ever identified what the creature was or knew about the legends. Only after almost a decade of intermittently seeing the Wendigo did I come across this description, courtesy of the Wikipedia article. The Wendigo was gone to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tautly over its bones. With its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash gray of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets, the Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody. Unclean and suffering from suppurations of the flesh, the Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odor of decay and decomposition, of death and corruption. I've done some further research, 
and all of the information I found from various sources all concurs with what I saw. So, I'm remotely linked to the Native Americans with whom the legend originated, I have always had a deathly, no pun intended, fear of dead bodies, especially mummified looking ones, and I saw a creature from their stories long before I learned that what I saw matched the traditional descriptions perfectly. I was, and still am, skeptical but even I can't ignore these coincidences. I'm also a Christian, Presbyterian, and therefore am quite wary of any claims of ghosts or supernatural entities inhabiting the world due to my beliefs, but even so, this thing has stuck with me for years. I saw it earlier today, which is why I'm here at all. Anyone got any insight? I've considered seeking out a highly knowledgeable Algonquian person to figure out what to do, but I'm torn because I also have some reservations about that from a religious perspective. I forgot to mention, I was born in Connecticut and moved to a South Carolina when I was about seven. I've been seeing it here in the South for almost 20 years now, even though I've moved all across the state during that time. Not sure if that's relevant because the Algonquians are situated in Virginia and up into Canada if I understand it right, and never came this far south. Also, I promise this post is sincere and not a fictional account that should be posted elsewhere. It sounds pretty fantastic even to me, the person who experienced it, but I can't shake the feeling that this isn't just my imagination. Seventh Story this story was shared by you slash dancing pan, so credits to him. Need help identifying a creature. This happened about 14 years ago. My boyfriend and I went to a graveyard one night BC he had told me a story about how he had seen something there. He didn't really want to take me, but I insisted. He said that he had heard stories about the place, and if you go there and sit every night, you'd eventually see it. He said he had finally seen the thing himself on the third or fourth consecutive night he visited, and it was man-like and gray, but he had only caught a glimpse of it and never went back afterward. I remember him saying he had car trouble when it appeared also. Well, I couldn't resist, I wanted to see it for myself. On the third night we saw it. We were sitting in the dark with the moon being the only source of light, man, we were dumb, and we both suddenly got creeped out for the first time since we had been visiting the place. We changed our minds about the whole thing and decided to leave and never come back, but lo and behold, the car, my car that has never had any trouble before, and not again for years after this incident, wouldn't start. My BF was driving that night and kept trying and it did eventually start up. When the headlight came on full force, we saw it standing right in front of the car. It was about 7 foot tall and it was grey, in fact it looked like a moving statue to me. It was kind of bent over just looking into the windshield at us and we were freaking the hell out. Finally it kind of shifted and the car started. The thing darted off to the left so quick, I knew that if it came to the side windows we'd both be dead within a minute. It was so, so fast. But it just stood to the side of the car watching us as we drove away. The cemetery was laid out where the gravel road, old, country cemetery, went around the whole graveyard in a circle and looped back around so the entrance is also the exit. We were spinning tires and slinging gravel the whole way around but when we passed the place where the thing was, it hadn't moved. It had been standing there watching us go around the gravel circle and it let us leave, but it was looking directly at me, the passenger side of the car was facing it, and I couldn't really make out any features BC it was dark, but I was overcome with the most severe depression I've ever felt in my life in that moment when I was looking back at the thing. It was like everyone and everything I cared about in my whole life was burned right before my eyes, the pain and hurt was almost tangible and it took my breath away in that moment. That night, when I was home and finally able to somehow sleep, I had a dream that the thing was calling to me from that graveyard, 
begging me to come back. It was harmless and miserable, stuck in that old cemetery forever and it was alone, so alone. When I woke up I was determined to go back to find the creature but before I could even tell my boyfriend, I got calls from him and two of my best friends. All three of them had nightmares where the thing had brutally murdered and mutilated me. The two girls who called me didn't know anything about the graveyard incident the night before, it was so late when I got back home I didn't tell anyone about it, just went to bed my BF dreamt that I had gone back to the place BC I felt bad for it so he drove out there after me. When he got there he found the thing ripping me apart, tearing me open. For a long time I had dreams about it saying, I won't hurt you, please come back and help me, I am suffering, and for a while I had to fight the urge to go back even after 3 PPL told me about their nightmares where I die. The pull isn't strong at all anymore, I guess it faded with time and kids and adulting, but I do think about it often and I do kind of get a little itch just to drive through and... I don't know, it would be dumb as hell but there's always been a little nagging voice that whispers about the thing we saw that night. It had a masculine physique, but no genitalia and its eyes were completely black, no iris or pupil or anything, just black inky nothingness. I've been searching all these years but the only pics I've seen that look even remotely like it are wendigos but not the ones with fur or antlers, just a grayish humanoid sexless thing. The best way I could describe it actually is. It looked like a statue to me. Does anyone have any ideas what this might be? It's bugged me for damn bare two decades and any suggestions will be appreciated. 8 Story This story was shared by you slash sincerely the suicidal so credits to him. I think there is a wendigo in the Minnesota woods. First things first I wasn't there but I was the first person he told. This happened in southeast Minnesota. I am not going to be telling the exact location but it was in a smallish forest on a long bike trail. One more quick thing. It was really windy this day. My friend who we will call S and his father were on a bike ride. It was about a 12 mile bike ride. So they are doing their thing when about 5 miles in S sees what he thinks is a deer. They keep going and S sees a flash of brown next to them in the trees and it is like this thing is running next to them. Like keeping pace, but he doesn't hear anything. He points it out to his dad and his father says that it's probably a deer but he agrees it is really weird, so they keep going. They get to this little beach where they usually rest and look at the river. S notices something feels off. He notices that first of all there is no trees swaying. Secondly there is no animal noises. Then he realizes he didn't see any animals the whole time they were there. Except the deer. The silence was heavy. It was like every animal left. The woods were silent. S tells his dad that he isn't feeling very well and that he wants to go home. His dad begrudgingly agrees. They get on their bikes and S is almost hyper aware of his surroundings. They go for a while until S sees a flash of brown again and antlers. They keep going until they hit this clearing. The clearing looks like a big field with trees around it and a bike trail through it, as they enter the clearing S looks back and there is the fucking beast standing on its hind legs and he said it was like 9 feet tall. It had antlers and it looked like it had a deer head or some shit. He said he was terrified. They finally got out of the woods and the wind was back and there was animal noises again. I think this was a wendigo, but I am not sure. I honestly don't know if I believe him but we are in Minnesota and it wouldn't be impossible, but are we a bit too far south for Wendigos? If you have any ideas or theories please let me know. Okay apparently I haven't hit the minimum word count so I'll give you more minor details. We are pretty much at the bottom of Minnesota. 
nowhere close to Rosisu, Minnesota. Like I said it was really windy this day like really windy. I think S is kinda sensitive to the paranormal. Just a little bit. Although the Wendigo isn't really paranormal. They have been biking on this trail before. They didn't go the whole way they went about half. I think it is too short to be a Wendigo. Is it possible it is a skinwalker? I looked on a map and the tribes that were in this area were the Dakota Sioux. This area usually has a lot of wildlife. It was before noon when this happened. He didn't see any other people other than him and his dad. Neither of us know what to think about this. I'll ask him about what it smelled like or if it smelled weird in the area. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end, subscribe to our channel horror in detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.